actionable intelligence, culling signal from noise, and the online resilience of threat groups. Ransomware hits a legal case management system. The city of Johannesburg continues its recovery from an online extortion attempt. The raccoon information stealer looks like a disruptive product in the criminal-to-criminal market. Not the best, but good enough and cheaper than the high-end alternatives. And who's more vulnerable to scams, seniors or young adults? It's complicated. And now a word from our sponsor, Coal Fire. When organizations stand up new services or move existing applications to the cloud, IT security efforts need to be coordinated with business units and partners. A common question inevitably arises. Is security the cloud platform provider's responsibility, or is it the customer's responsibility? To optimize data security, you must clearly articulate who owns what, identify security gaps, and determine who will close those gaps. With the introduction of the High Trust Shared Responsibility Program, there's now a solid path to address the misunderstandings, risks, and complexities when partnering with cloud service providers. Coalfire has delivered hundreds of High Trust CSF certifications since 2011, and they help organizations clarify the roles and responsibilities of security controls that protect information. They've certified the leading global cloud service providers and can help you migrate data to the cloud securely. Find out more from Coalfire, the High Trust Cloud Assessor, at coalfire.com slash high trust. That's coalfire.com slash H I T R U S T. And we thank Coal Fire for sponsoring our show. Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by McAfee. Security built by the power of harnessing one billion threat sensors from device to cloud. Intelligence that enables you to respond to your environment and insights that empower you to change it. McAfee, the device to cloud cybersecurity company. Go to McAfee.com slash insights. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Monday, October 28, 2019. ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi died Saturday in Syria's Idlib province, killing himself and, sadly, three of his children as U.S. Special Operations Forces cornered the terrorist leader in a tunnel. According to The Voice of America, U.S. Defense Secretary Esper said late-breaking actionable intelligence developed that morning enabled the attack to be executed within hours. Reuters says al-Baghdadi was located with the assistance of captured ISIS leaders. Whatever its accuracy, this report and others like it will probably erode the terrorist group's relationships of trust. One of al-Baghdadi's principal lieutenants, spokesman Abu Hassan al-Muhajir, was killed in a U.S. airstrike hours after the Idlib raid, the Times reports. A Bloomberg op-ed argues that terrorist groups like ISIS have proven resilient to leaders' deaths. Expect any regrouping to be foreshadowed by information operations. What sort of late-breaking actionable intelligence Defense Secretary Esper referred to is, of course, and quite properly, left unclear. But developing target indicators into targets can be a difficult process, and indicators are often missed. One such set of indicators seems to have surrounded one of the last high-profile massacres el-Baghdadi claimed for ISIS, the Easter massacres in Sri Lanka this April. A parliamentary select committee convened to review the attack concluded that Sri Lanka's intelligence leaders missed reports that should have alerted them to an imminent attack. Those reports began arriving as early as April 4th, 17 days before the April 21st attack. Apart from direct observation of online terrorist chatter, which can be notoriously noisy, the security forces are said to have failed to act on domestic police warnings and alerts fed to them by Indian intelligence services. Missing signal is an old problem. The U.S. certainly did the same during the run-up to 9-11. This weekend, as the Diwali celebrations arrived, authorities in India raised the alert level in several cities as the Pakistan-based terror group jaish e Mohammed threatened attacks against those celebrating the Hindu Festival of Lights. Those attacks seem not to have materialized, and that's another instance of chatter being disruptive noise. A ransomware attack against TrialWorks, a widely used legal case management system, has caused disruption of trials and schedules as TrialWorks recovers and as the law firms that use the product look for workarounds and alternatives. 
Bleeping Computer says the ransomware strain involved is so far unknown, but the attack resembles in some respects August incidents that involved GanCrab's successor, R. Evil Sodinokibi. TrialWorks says it's decrypting the affected files, which has led to speculation that they went ahead and paid the ransom. The city of Johannesburg sustained a breach Thursday that led it to suspend most online services. The group claiming responsibility, the Shadow Kill Hackers, has said they'll publicly dump all the stolen data if they weren't paid for Bitcoin by 5 p.m. Johannesburg time today. That was 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern time, so the deadline has come and gone. We don't have any word yet on whether the Shadow Kill Hackers have done what they threatened to do or whether Johannesburg has paid up. Here's what Johannesburg City staffers told SC Magazine was in the note they received. Quote, Hello, Joburg City. Here are Shadow Kill hackers speaking. All of your servers and data have been hacked. We have dozens of back doors inside your city. We have control of everything in your city. We can shut off everything with a button. We also compromised all passwords and sensitive data, such as finance and personal population information. Your city must pay us for bitcoins. If you don't pay on time... We will upload the whole data available to anyone in the Internet. We note in passing that their style is like a somewhat less over-the-top version of Shadow Broker Ease, a scriptwriter's conception of broken English we confess we continue to miss. The attack was initially described as ransomware, but that may be misleading. There does indeed appear to be an extortion demand, but the disruption to city services appears to have been largely a precautionary measure taken by the city government itself which tweeted that interruption of services were consequences of the investigation. The city said that customers will not be able to transact on e-services or log queries via the city's call center or customer service centers. Most services were restored over the weekend. The shadow kill hackers made two threats. In addition to dumping the information online and telling everyone how they got it, they also threatened to delete all the data permanently, If that's more than an empty threat, it suggests they dropped a wiper into Johannesburg's network. Researchers at security firm Cyber Reason have offered their take on the raccoon information stealer that's gaining black market share in the criminal-to-criminal markets. It's not sophisticated, but it's relatively cheap and easy to use, which makes it a classic example of a disruptive product. Raccoon is available for $175 to $200, and it's usually delivered via the Fallout or Rig exploit kits. Raccoon's native home seems to be the Russian criminal underground. It began as a password stealer, but has expanded into other forms of data theft. And finally, who's most gullible with respect to online scams? Specifically, which age cohort is likeliest to take the fish bait, and who's more predisposed to spit the hook? Well, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission has reached what will be for many a surprising, counterintuitive conclusion on the matter. You may think that the proverbial grandpa and grandma are likelier to fall victim to phishing scams than others. But no. Actually, people over 60 are less likely to take the fish bait than are younger adults, particularly millennials. The FTC's recent report on protecting older consumers reached that conclusion. There is a downside, however. While older adults are less likely to fall for scams than are the young adults, when seniors do bite on the fraud, their losses tend to be higher. Those over 80 seem to take the biggest hit per scam. So everyone, young or old, click with caution and read with appropriate open-minded skepticism, which is good advice at any age. And now a word from our sponsor, Know Before. Having spent over a decade as part of the CIA's Center for Cyber Intelligence and the Counterterrorism Mission Center, Rosa Smothers knows the ins and outs of leading cyber operations against terrorists and nation-state adversaries. She's seen firsthand how the bad guys operate. She knows the threat they pose. And she can tell you how to use that knowledge to make organizations like yourself a hard target. Get the inside spy scoop and find out why Rosa, now know before's SVP of Cyber Operations, encourages organizations like yours to maintain a healthy sense of paranoia. Go to knowbefore.com slash CIA to learn more about this exclusive webinar. That's K-N-O-W-B-E numeral four dot com slash CIA. And we thank Know Before for sponsoring our show.
And joining me once again is Joe Kerrigan. He's from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, also my co-host on the Hacking Humans podcast. Joe, it's great to have you back. It's good to be back, Dave. Uh, before we dig into today's story, you have a little bit of follow-up for us. I have us. Uh, some correction. Uh, last week, I made the comment that I was considering not giving future health care providers my actual birth date, mm-hmm. and someone hit me up on Twitter, Franklin, thank you for pointing this out, that if you do that, then your claims may not be paid because that piece of PII is used to identify you with the insurance company. Ah. So uh, if the insurance company gets a different birth date, they're going to say, this isn't the right Joe Kerrigan, and they're not going to pay my claim, and I have to give them the correct birth date because uh, I need to give the my employer my correct birth date, who then gives it to my insurance company who then asks my doctor for it. I see. So you so, could be shooting yourself in the foot. Yep. So All don't right. do that. If you've already done it, go out and correct it. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Well, uh, this week uh, we're talking about a story that came by from ThreatPost. This is from uh, Tom Spring, and mm-hmm. it's titled, 15 Years Later, Metasploit Still Manages to Be a Menace. A menace. A me- I don't like that term. A menace. <laughs> and a useful tool for penetration <laughs> testers. Yeah. Well, <laughs> before we dig in here, just a quick overview on what is Metasploit for folks who may not be familiar with it. Metasploit is a friend framework. I'm not intimately familiar with it, but it is a tool that you can use to penetrate uh, networks. It comes pre-bundled with a bunch of known exploits. Mm. And if you discover an exploit or a vulnerability, then you can write your own exploits in Metasploit and uh, have them run and you can distribute them as well so that other penetration testers can use it as well. But just like any other tool, it can be misused Mm. and frequently is misused. Right. Um, When you hear the term script kitty, these are generally people who are who are learning to use Metasploit and running very simple attacks against other targets that may not be protected against it. And there is even a uh, graphic user interface called Armitage for the Metasploit framework. I see. So it makes hacking very easy. But that's the intent of the tool was to make was it was designed by a guy who had you know was a network administrator and had to do all this other stuff along with have uh, test the security of his network, so he automated the process of te- testing the security of his mm. network. He built a tool to make his own job easier, Yep. shared it with the community, Yep. and of course any tool can be used for good or bad. Right. So what are they getting at here with their uh, with the, the notion that it uh, could be a menace? They're, they're talking about a particular technique that Metasploit presents called Shikata Ganai, which is Japanese for nothing can be done. And what it does is it makes your exploit polymorphic, so it's very difficult to see it when you when it's coming in through your network. Hmm. So detection systems are less likely to find it, uh, and the exploit is more likely to be successful. So it's doing some some encryption, some scrambling of, of what your yep, it uses, software would be looking for. It uses something called XOR encryption. Uh-huh. It's a very basic type of encryption. Uh, it is good, and actually it's technically unbreakable if you have a long enough random key. But those keys are one-time use keys. It's effectively a one-time pad cipher. Hmm. So XOR is a bitwise operator, which means that if you go through a string of bits one at a time, you can encode them with a key. But the the great thing about it is that you can decode them with the same operation and the same key. Hmm. So if I have a key that's exactly as long as the message that has enough randomness, it imparts all of that randomness to the message, and then that randomness is easily deciphered with with the same key. Okay. But it pretty much requires pre-shared keys or or some way to share that key. And those keys can only be used once. If you use them multiple times, it's very easy to break the, break the encryption. I see. So that's that's a high-level look at, at XOR encryption. And so as that applies to Metasploit here, it's, it's just a matter of making the making the scripts harder to detect? Right. What they're doing is they're using XOR to make the payloads uh, harder to detect because they essentially look like random strings of bits. And then uh, once the payload is in the target system, it's trivial to decrypt it if the software has the key. All right. So, I mean, overall, Metasploit, uh, valuable tool. But just like any other tool, it's going to have bad uses and, and people that are good, at, very good at using it. And there are people out there that are remarkably good at using this tool. A lot of them are on the good guy side. But a lot of them are also on the bad guy side. Yeah. All right. Well, Joe Kerrigan, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Observit, the leading insider threat management platform. Learn more at observit.com.
Don't forget to check out the Grumpy Old Geeks podcast, where I contribute to a regular segment called Security Ha! Huh? I join Jason and Brian on their show for a lively discussion of the latest security news every week. You can find Grumpy Old Geeks where all the fine podcasts are listed. And check out the Recorded Future podcast, which I also host. The subject there is threat intelligence, and every week we talk to interesting people about timely cybersecurity topics. That's at recordedfuture.com slash podcast. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our amazing CyberWire team is Stefan Vaziri, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Nick Vilecki, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>